the, the holy grail of macro is trying to find the model that delivers a nice internal propagation of shocks, not something we just made up. Okay, welcome back. Happy New Year. And uh, I hope you weren't too terrified from the, by the last lecture. It was kind of technical, but that's kind of the tone of the rest of the course. We need to think really hard about uh, dynamics in the rest of the course. And to do that, we need to have some um, basic command of, of these instruments, these, these tools. We call them difference equations. I'll repeat some of that today. And um, please look at the slides. It's, it's important. And please visit Andreas in the uh, section. OK, so today we're going we're gonna to basically um, review what we did last time. And I'm going to introduce you to the first serious model of business cycles. What we did before this. ASAD model uh, was kind of a toy model just to get you thinking about the, the mechanism by which shocks are propagated into, into cycles. Shocks that are completely random in nature and possibly unpredictable even from period to period can still be transferred or tr translated into waves, irregular waves. So this Slutsky uh, idea is very important in macroeconomics today. Uh, to do that, um, we even gave you a problem set that has a different set, different model. So the model in the problem set, which you really should do, is the so-called multiplier accelerator model of Paul Samuelson that was introduced in the 1930s. So Paul Samuelson, one of the greatest economists of the 20th century, the guy who introduced mathematics to the way we think about macro and micro, um, he basically tried to show that a very simple model that Keynes had put on the table in 1936 could be translated into these cycles. Now, he was thinking about deterministic cycles, but he still had some interesting insights. So the idea would, that the problem set, um, which Andreas will discuss in detail, is basically taking um, these ideas which applied to the ASAD model, which is a modern framework. Again, we can put it on paper, and we can also put it on the computer, which I will do in a second. Um, and you can do it in a very fancy way that involves a lot more uh, mathematical muscle. Um, these ideas are all making recourse to the same basic notion of a stochastic difference equation, a shocked difference equation. Okay, so that's an extremely important thing, so important that I will review it briefly again. Okay, so I warn you, uh, this is not to be ignored. I'm glad a lot of people are here on this awful uh, 8th of January. Um, this weather is not great. It's not it's really perfect for studying, okay? It's perfect to make you think hard about macroeconomics. So we're going to do, do that quickly, and then I'm going to talk about expectations formation. So in the ASAD model, the toy model has a big problem, which is it has a very mechanical way of thinking about the way people expect the future. And one of the biggest revolutions in macroeconomics was in the 1970s, brought about by the work of Milton Friedman and Edmund Phelps. And their revolution was thinking about um, people's ability to actually think as well as or better than economists themselves. The idea would be is simply uh, how arrogant of economists to think they can cook a model and exploit it for policy purposes without thinking about the individual agent's ability to adapt their behavior to that policy intention, OK? Um, so this is kind of a mixture of what Milton Friedman and Edmund Phelps talked about, which is the stability of the Phillips curve, uh, with some ideas that Robert Lucas and um, Tom Sargent in the 1970s picked up on. And they continue to accompany everything we do in macroeconomics today, even though we have a, what's called a, a modified or new Keynesian uh, approach to macroeconomics and is the dominant paradigm uh, dominating thinking uh, in all schools today, even the most, um, the most um, neoclassical approaches admit some role for uh, rigidity in uh, price setting, almost everyone. Uh, we need to think about that, because any model that we write down should be uh, able to withstand the criticism that agents should not make persistent mistakes in that model. Okay, So that's why expectations and Taking it one step further, rational expectations is an important way of thinking, disciplining the modeling strategy. Remember, modeling is like devising a lens to look at the data, a lens to look at the world. And if you have a lens that is um, 
got a couple of scratches on it, it's not going to work very well. Um, and you need to always think about the lenses are imperfect because they'll filter out certain things that we don't want to see, certain types of radiation we don't want to have in our eyes. Um, that's kind of the way uh, lenses work. Okay, so the rational expectations criticism is simply a model should be robust um, to people figuring out how the economy works as we think the economy works. And I'll give you some, some information on how we do that operationally. There are three basic forms of rational expectations. Then I'll take you into the world of macroeconomics, some data, okay? Because what drives us in this, in this world is data, and we want to be able to replicate with our models cycles that look like cycles in the data, okay? So we want to see output that moves you know, up and down, but we want to see unemployment that moves in the opposite direction over the cycle. We want to see inflation that maybe is mildly but not completely pro-cyclical, maybe even dependent on the period you look at. I say that with caution because in the 1970s, inflation and output moved in opposite directions, but over the course of the last 100 years, output and inflation tend to move pro-cyclically in the same direction. And a lot of other things, for example, right now, there's a lot of discussion in the world about what's happening with Trump, okay? So, I mean, I love to talk about Trump. Um, Trump was a shock, to, to be elected was a shock. It was also kind of a shock that he came down so hard on China with these, with these threats of, of import duties. He's actually followed through with it. This was a surprise, this was a shock. The impact on world trade is a shock, and it has a shock on demand, not just in the United States, but also here in Germany, okay? So we need to understand that also. And these shocks give, give rise to cyclical fluctuations. And um, again, one way of understanding that is to, is to reduce the sources of shocks. So for the first class of shock, uh, models we'll look at, we'll only think about models that have one type of shock. And then we'll expand the notion to different types of shocks. We already have in the ASAD, we had a demand shock and a supply shock. So if, if you want to make a quick judgment of what's going on in the world today, you need to understand the facts. You need to understand a good way of looking at the facts. And the, the quick and dirty model I gave you, the toy model, gives us an interpretation of the Trump thing. It's a shock on demand. It's a shock to demand for US goods because China is now putting retaliatory tariffs on the United States and it's cutting down the demand for US goods and services. At the same time, the stock market is crashing. Okay, we know from the data, from the stylized facts, that the stock market is pro-cyclical, it's a leading indicator. So we need to have a model that can interpret the stock market as a pro-cyclical leading indicator. So these are all really interesting, robust things that a model has to pick up. If you want to take a model seriously, it's really easy to write down a model. It's, I mean, anyone can do that now. Anyone who has any sort of mathematic background. The question is, is it okay? Is it decent? Can it withstand uh, the, the strong winds of falsification as many scientists throw facts? Hey, can you explain that? Can you see this? Do you, do you, do you account for that? So we will start with this model as a training ground for the New Keynesian model, and it's called the stochastic growth model. So this is the, this is the link, the bridge to the previous part of the course. The second half of the course is about mac macro um, fluctuations. The first part of the course was about macro growth. And the bridge would be something like a, a model in which uh, instead of continuous time, we have discrete time, and we have shocks to that model in every period. So that's making this bridge you can think of this model as having all the interesting aspects of the first part of the course, optimizing agents, okay, and adding some other new bells and whistles that make it even better in, in trying to account for stylized facts, okay? So that'll be the introduction. And next week we'll do the stochastic growth, the so-called RBC, or real business model in detail, okay? We'll only spend a couple of hours, a couple of sessions on that because in my view, the real business cycle model is augmentable, okay? It's, it's basically a basis for understanding the new Keynesian models of the latest generation. And if you go on to take courses with Professor Weinke, you'll see that there's a lot more you can put into this model, modules you could park in the model that make the model even more interesting and speak to regularities in the data. Uh, we have. Okay, so last time we, we introduced stochastic difference equations. I call this the bread and butter of macroeconomics, okay? You really need to understand this if you want to take any further courses, have any other further understanding, okay? Stochastic difference equations is the way we work. It's like having a hammer. 
And you need a hammer to do a lot of things, perhaps not everything, but a lot of things. When you're a carpenter, you need a lot of uh, tools in addition, but you need to start with the basic uh, hammer. Okay, and we talked about the impulse response function as a modern way of describing the dynamic response of a system to a one-time shock, full, not, in full knowledge of the fact that have you shocked the equation or the system of equations every period, you get even more interesting dynamics. Okay, and I gave you a cookbook approach. Now, Andreas will repeat this cookbook approach in a slightly different way to make you aware that in the literature there are two different ways of discussing this problem. Some of you may be coming from time series analysis. You know, is anyone out there who's taking time series? Okay, well, just so many people. Okay, sometimes there are lots of people, sometimes there's no one. Um, there are different ways of, they have the same idea, it's just a slightly different tack. Okay, I want you to understand that both tacks lead to the same outcome. Okay. And we're going to talk about the difference equation um, in the lag operator as a way of getting to this, this uh, solution of the difference equation. The solution of the difference equation is the expression of the current variable yt as a function of time only and some constants. Okay, that's an important way of thinking about it because the, the, the difference equation itself expresses yt as a function of yt minus 1 and yt minus 2 and maybe further lags if you had a higher order difference equation. Here, we want to be able to solve the equation as a function of time only. So it's a, it'll be basically, you'll express this yt as a constant plus powers of the characteristic roots of the difference equation, the polynomial in the dif difference equation. Okay, so that's, the, that's the, the understanding we're gonna have for this thing. And the, if you think of powers of time means that if, as time goes to infinity, those contributions to, the, to yt must get smaller and smaller. If they don't, the, yt is exploding. So the, the, the fundamental primitive requirement for an unconditionally stable difference equation is that those characteristic roots all have to lie inside the unit circle. Okay, if you solve them in a, as roots to a polynomial in the, um, a, a, um, the characteristic equation, as Andreas will show you, those roots have to be outside the unit circle. But the, basically, the, the lambda t I have are the powers, are the, are the same solutions that Andreas will der derive inverse, one over, okay? So that's a very easy way of understanding what we're about to do. And then last time we also went back to the ASAD model and we sort of looked at the shocking, um, the shocking of the ASAD model and what happens, how you can get cycles. I'll give you an example of that in a second. Okay, and then finally, very important, this is a generalizable approach. So even though I just discussed a very simple toy model that had everything just perfect, it reduced to an AR, uh, an autoregressive second order difference equation, second order difference equation, that was easy to sort of play with, at least from, from my perspective, it was relatively easy. You know, you can actually get even more fancy, and in real life, you might have several equations. Okay, it turns out that you can put this in a so-called co companion form or canonical form, and that allows us to, to evaluate the eigenvalues of a matrix and get the same uh, results. Okay, let me return quickly to that model. This is, again, this is, Stuff that you may have had from, from undergraduate encounters with macroeconomics, very interesting, a way of understand. It's a very general sort of, you know, for people who don't go further than the bachelor's degree, this is the way to go. But, you know, our objective in this part of the course, in this course, is to put life into A1, A2, C1, C2, try to understand what these constants are. Okay, so we want to go beyond that in this course. But I just need that to, to, to fix ideas, to get you on the same wavelength, we have a demand side. The demand side consists of a, an aggregate demand equation, which is a positive function of the previous value. So there's an automatic sort of persistence hardwired into the model. And then you've got A2, which is uh, negative, which expresses the negative dependence of aggregate demand on the real interest rate. Okay, so it, the real interest rate is the nominal interest rate minus the inflation rate. And then you've got this shock, this demand shock, which can be anything. It can be a shock to government spending. It can be a shock to tax policy. It could be a foreign demand for your goods. It could be a, a tariff shock or whatever you like. 
The, not, the second equation is the Taylor rule. The Taylor rule expresses how the Federal Reserve System or the European Central Bank, the Bank of China, reacts to the policy initiatives that give rise to its interest rate policy, the policy drivers. So central banks don't like inflation, okay? Um, and they don't like it, so when interest rates, um, when, when inflation is high, central banks react to inflation by raising the interest rate by more than one to one. It's kind of called the Taylor principle. C2 is positive because central banks also don't like output to get out of control. Okay, so they want to lean against the wind. We talked about this last year. Okay, so this is ba these are basically assumptions about the policy rule that the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England or the the Banque de France, well, the, sorry, the, the European Central Bank follow. The Banque de France is part of the European system of central banks. I'm still getting over the euro. It's 20 years later. I still can't uh, remember that the Bundesbank. Uh, it exists on paper, but it's really just a part of this European system of central banks. That's the demand side. So that's the AD curve. The AS curve is the next curve, which basically says that, and we'll go into this in detail in the rest of this course, that the inflation, the behavior of inflation is a, is a function of three things. It's basically the inflation of what people have expected it to be in the past. Uh, we call that core inflation. Some people call it inflationary expectations, a very particular view. And the second part is the sensitivity of price setting to the output gap. So when the economy, remember YT is the output gap now. I told you that already. This is the percentage deviation from, out, from, from the solo trend. And when YT is positive, that means the economy is, is uh, operating above capacity or above average output. And that means the firms tend to raise prices and that tends to translate into higher uh, prices at the stores. And it also means that workers have negotiating power, ask for higher wages, they get, these get passed on in higher prices. These are all the things we'll talk about in about two, two weeks. The third part of the aggregate supply story is the supply shock. These are the things that happen given the first two. So in economics, we condition everything all the time. Conditional on people's expectations of inflation, conditional on the output gap. What happens if OPEC, gets its act together and raises the oil price by 100%. Okay, what would happen if Trump in, in, in March raises the tariff another 25% on Chinese goods? What's gonna happen to inflation in America? It's probably gonna go up given the output gap and given the inflation that people expect. Okay, that's just a simple, again, this is a toy model, believe me. It gets really interesting when we start thinking about the microeconomic foundations of these behavioral equations. Again, this is undergraduate, undergraduate stuff. The last part is the closure of the model. So how do we get, how do we think about this core inflation? And this is a simple way for you to get this quickly. Um, I'm doing this for people who maybe are coming from a, maybe even a hard science background or people are coming from literature or something. I, one, of my, one of my best PhD students, um, and best master student was actually coming from, you know, Germanistic. So there's hope for everybody out there, right? <laughs> I mean, you like this stuff. You have to like it. Otherwise, it's just crazy to even be sitting here right now. You have to like it. And you can see that I like it because I've been here for, I've been doing this for 35 years. I'm really into this stuff, right? Okay, so the, sec the last equation is a simple, just to put it on a plate for you, it's not the whole story, but one nice way of thinking about corn core inflation is that it's kind of a mixture of people getting it just right and people just completely morons. They're looking backward and they just take the last observation of inflation as their expectation for the, for the inflation today, okay? We would call that autoregressive. So the extreme case would be, if you want to think about it, if you think about we try to, I mean, this particular setup, I, I restrict to an open interval. So, so theta can't take the value zero or one. But if theta did take the value one, it would be like a completely backward looking uh, agent thinking about inflation. Okay, on the other hand, if the agents are super smart and they, they, have the, they know exactly what the price of everything is in every second, they have all the information. It's kind of about information in the end. It's also about not having the information then basically you'd get the inflation rate right every period. So you can imagine in that version of the model, as, as, as theta goes to one, um, 
I think I said I misspoke before. Theta going to zero was the case of the adaptive expectation. Theta, theta goes to one, um, you have almost perfect uh, foresight. People get it exactly right. And in those cases, the, the aggregate supply uh, curve is, is the entire story. There is no st other story. The model is determined by shocks to supply side. You can see that if you want by going to the model and playing with it yourself. Okay, so these are the definitions again. I put this in so you could uh, remind yourself what these things are. And again, this is a toy model just to get you going. I urge you now, in this point of the course where you've got some, you know, some sort of uh, interest in getting through the course and also getting, getting, mastering these techniques, play with this as just after you solve the problem set with Andreas. Okay. So the, the nice thing about the toy model, this toy model, is that it's easy to solve. Okay, you can do it in a couple of substitutions. You don't have to use the matrix form that I did before. Okay, okay so you can do the substitution, and then you end up getting this last equation, which is simply this second order difference equation, and it's inhomogeneous because you have this constant, which is not even constant. Every period is a different value because it's shocked. Okay, so in the rest of the, this, the next five minutes, we'll talk about how this difference e equation, second order, depends when, when epsilon is constant. In fact, we'll make it constant uh, and then look at the behavior, and then we'll ask the question, okay, suppose we take the shock and let it be one in one period and then take it away. And you'll, that's the most interesting part. How does the system damp to some... Um, to its uh, steady state. Okay, we call that a reduced form or a univariate reduced form. And you should be, convince yourself that epsilon is not white noise. Remember, white noise is a very important concept for us in macro. It means independent and identically distributed random influences. Now, if you don't know more about the economy, it's probably a good idea to assume that the behavior of Trump is kind of like white noise, okay? But, you know, we can actually predict some of what he's doing. You can predict some of what of, of Mario Draghi's doing and the policy uh, makers in general. So, you know, in general, we want to... These are things that we haven't anticipated. Okay, but in this particular model, the reduced form of that setup, in this form, epsilon t is not white noise. It's actually a complicated... Uh, it's a mixture of two random variables. One is um, a moving average of the demand shock and the other is the supply shock. So you should look at that. But it doesn't really matter because we're just looking at epsilon t as a constant and looking at the behavior of the system um, in response to an isolated shock. And that's what we get when we, we're looking at when we look at impulse response functions. Okay? And this extends to everything we do in macro. So in Vader and macro, you can, you can actually ask a computer program to do this for you. It's not like you have to do it yourself, but you can actually ask a computer program to plot the impulse response function for the next... 200 periods to a single shock to your model. Depending on how you fix you put it together, it may look quite different. Okay? So here's the equation we want to solve. And now I'm setting epsilon t to a constant epsilon zero. It's the shock in period zero. Okay? So if that shock were to persi per persist forever, how would the, the, how would the equation respond to that? Okay, so you already see, well, there are lots of possibilities. It may just explode. It may explode in the positive direction. It may explode in the negative direction. It may cycle. It may go up and then down and then converge monotonically. Okay, that's the interesting thing about second order difference equations. You have a, a plethora of possibilities. Okay, I gave you a cookbook to talk about that. And the cookbook is you find the particular solution. We call that the steady state in English. Okay, and in growth theory, we called it the steady state. So let's just say, okay, um, nothing else happens, no further shocks. Where is y going to end up? It's going to be epsilon zero divided by one minus alpha one minus alpha two. That's easy. That's the particular solution. And the general solution to this difference equation is equal to the sum of solutions to this difference equation. Okay, and one of them is going to be called the particular solution. The other is the solution around the difference of the actual variable yt from its steady state. So we're decomposing 
the behavior of our dynamical system into its fluctuations around the steady state and the steady state itself. So once you've identified, and this is a generalized principle, so once you've identified the particular solution, you can look at the deviation as also being a solution to the equation, but it is a homogeneous solution because if you scale up yt in that solution, it doesn't matter, okay? It's independent. Uh, sorry, if you scale up the variable, not yt. Yeah, yt, right. You scale it up, it doesn't matter. So it's independent of the constant. It has no constant term. That's why it's called a homogeneous solution, okay? So you need to solve for those lambdas. That's what I did last time. And basically, the, the equation is, is a simply a sum of weighted averages, and the weights are constant, kappa 1 and kappa 2, they have to be solved for. And then you need to know these lambdas, and then you raise those lambs to the teeth power. Okay, and you can see basically how it works. If lambda 1 and lambda 2 um, are greater than 1 in some sense, then you're gonna have a problem. If lambda 1 and lambda 2 are real valued, and if one of them is real valued, the other will be real valued, then you have no problem understanding it. So lambda 1 equals 0.9 is great because lambda equals 0.9 raised to the 200th power is going to be a small number. It's going to come close to zero. So the thing will not explode. And the same thing is true for the other one. But if they're complex conjugate numbers, you may need to refresh your knowledge of complex conjugate numbers. They come in pairs, and they can be expressed in the polar form, which means a function of the cosine and sine of a variable times t, okay? And if you do that, um, you have to think a little bit harder, but it's, it's not a hard problem. It's just a, it's just a, um, a translated or displaced cosine function. And the most important thing is the distance of that root to the unit circle. And if that thing is greater, that distance is greater than one, then you still have the explosive problem. You have a wave that's exploding, basically. And I'll show you an example of how that could work in a second. Okay, so to do that, you need to get the lambdas. We did that last time, so I'm not gonna review all the slides. I'm going kind of slow to it because I really want you to get this stuff. Uh, getting these roots, okay, these, these, um, these lambdas that you're gonna be raising to the teeth power as you move through time uh, will be a function of your original uh, alpha one and alpha two. So it is possible that you get complex conjugate numbers. If the, the object under the radical, under the square root sign is less than zero, you gotta, you, it's not a problem, it means a mathematical challenge, okay? You're gonna have a, an, a complex conjugate um, um, set of roots that you have to, to deal with. But that, that's, not a, that's not an issue, you can rewrite the thing and you get a, a basically a displaced cosine function, okay? So, Again, this is just repeating, this slide is a repeat from last time. Um, if you want to find kappa one and kappa two, it's just a function of the initial conditions. And that makes sense because where you, where you wind up um, depends on where you started. If you start from zero in period zero and period minus one, or in period minus one and period minus two, then basically there's no baggage that you're carrying forward. But if you haven't, then basically where you wind up as a result of this epsilon shock will be different. Okay, so that's, that's an important way of um, remembering what's going on. Okay, and the result is a complete solution. So go back, download the slides if you haven't done that already, very important, or do the readings. And uh, the implications of dynamics are very interesting. Okay, so we get this equation, um, and we have the particular solution, which is the steady state, and then you've got the deviation of the steady state from um, the actual variable, the actual current realization of yt, the value of yt. The deviation of yt from its steady state is equal to the second part, which is the homogeneous uh, solution. And those roots can be outside the unit circle. They can be inside the unit circle. If they're outside the unit circle, that means that the, the and if they're complex conjugate, that means that the waves are getting bigger and bigger. It's like being in a tsunami that's getting worse and worse and worse. And it's, it's not a good model. We don't observe that in the reality, so you shouldn't be playing with that type of model. We'd like to have models that converge to the steady state, because that's what we observe in the data. Okay, so let me give you an example, of, and I'll put this, if you'd like, I, I can post this on the, on the, um, on the website. It's, a, it's simply, I, this, is an, this, is a, this is a no brainer. This is like taking a spreadsheet and doing this. You know, when you get, when you, when you get to like this, you use better 
uh, software, you can use MATLAB and stuff. This is like taking <laughs> this with Excel, okay? So basically I've plotted, um, for some reason it's not, it's, uh, let's try it again. Yeah. Okay, so this is what happens if you plug in a displaced cosine function. Um, and there are interesting things that you can derive. You've, you've, we've already shown last week that you can get this angular frequency by looking at the roots, given by the roots of the equation. The damping is the most important thing. That's the, that's the, the modulus of the root. If that thing is less than one, then you're in business. You have con unconditional convergence. So in this particular example, um, the modulus of the roots I looked at is 0.95. So it's going to be slow damping. It's going to take um, a long time for, the, for the, uh, the oscillations to go, go away, not, not visible to the human eye. They're still there, but they're really small. Okay? But the first uh, 20 to 40 periods, you still have significant wave-like motion. And the displacement is a function of the initial condition. Okay, so that's, it's really an interesting, um, and here there's no phase shift. A, this is in response to a negative shock. Okay, now I'll give you another example of how the ASAD translates into that same um, form. Okay, so this is a, this is a, a model, um, the ASAD model. I've just put in values for A1, A2, B1, uh, theta, okay, and Basically, you see, you get something like a, and this is the response not only of output, but of inflation. Okay, so I've actually, I've taken the out, solution for output and I've used that to solve for the inflation. So you can have this. You can also derive it directly using the, the, um, the companion form of, of the uh, reduced, reduced form. Okay, this is just to show you an example. So if I were to change, and you can change it at, at your pleasure, uh, any of those parameters, and you can get different amplitudes for the waves. You can get more dis more uh, damping or less damping, and the like. Okay, so this is just a way of showing you how important it is that the underlying parameters of the model affect the dynamics uh, that come out afterwards. Okay. So it's important that you look at that stuff and get, get a handle on what the roots mean, what it means to have complex conjugate roots. This is just the beginning. So when I start talking about a serious model that we use in macro, uh, it turns out that the, the unconditional convergence is not necessary. Okay, so the, we'll, be, we'll be dealing with models that have some roots that are outside the, the unit circle. Okay, so we need to deal with that problem. But you need to understand this to get to that point. One of the things that's interesting about this uh, discussion is that agents' expectations can also be wrong. And if they're wrong, that can also be thought of as a shock. Agents may also just have exogenous periods of frenzy. Okay, so this is something uh, economists are more and more interested in, uh, the possibility of irrational uh, sort of surges of irrationality and how that would affect the dynamics of the economy. This is related to what we think of as a shock, okay? But, but to understand that last statement, you need to go back and understand why the, the fact that agents get it wrong is kind of like a disturbance. It's like, a, like making a mistake, okay? And this has to do with the, with the Phillips curve, which we discussed last year in the last, um, in the first part of the last uh, end of the, the, of the of last year, okay, and we said that basically the reason why the Phillips curve is downward sloping, and the reason why the supply curve is upward sloping, is because agents have expectations of prices, and uh, and wages that that may not be right. So when wages and prices um, deviate positively from their expectations, agents may be tempted to produce more, to work harder, and um, when they make these mistakes, 
you know, this is a, an issue, and maybe we need to think hard about those, those uh, expectations and those expectational errors. So agents were, and the old-fashioned models that started with Phillips and moved into the, to the 1960s, I gave you that example, um, the United States exploiting the Phillips curve and then getting burned. Um, it's a great example of what Milton Friedman said is that if you, if you kind of fool agents, then you can, you can extract more output or you can push the economy beyond its uh, productive limits. Okay, but the problem with that is it's based on the notion that people make mistakes and you can continuously, persistently uh, fool those agents. Okay, and this is not a great basis for policy. That was the criticism of Milton Friedman and uh, later Robert, Lu Robert Lucas and Thomas Sargent. So it's still a part of this, this notion of having shocks, okay, but the shocks can also be these expectational mistakes. Okay, and again, think about the Phillips curve again. I'm doing this to remind you of how important this is uh, and how in, the, in the, the grand scheme of economic uh, history, history of economic thought actually, how agents, uh, how, how economists have thought about people making decisions and the like. This is Phillips curve uh, that he wrote about in 1958. Okay, you can see there's pretty, pretty convincing negative um, semi-logarithmic or logarithmic relationship between inflation, wage inflation, and unemployment during the gold standard. This is a time when inflationary expectations were probably constant because everyone in the world was thinking about gold and the development of the money supply and the, the, if you, no matter what version of neutrality you believe in was kind of governed by this gold standard. So it was, it was pretty reasonable to think that people believed that the inflation rate at the time, which was fairly low, possibly negative because the gold supply wasn't keeping up with, with output, um, um, was not changing very much. So Phillips discovered this. You know, he discovered this in 1958 looking at old-fashioned data. Didn't even look at the Great Depression. Okay? So you know, he put it on the table, got it published in Economica, and everyone said, wow, this is great. This is the key between old-fashioned Keynes 1936 and the neoclassical uh, view that the supply side wins in the end and uh, we need to look at the production function. Okay, so this is what got it all going. This is, what, this is the story behind the debate that we call the neoclassical synthesis and um, you know, Milton Friedman and Phelps' criticism of that in the 19, late 1960s and early 1970s. Okay? Now I like to do this, I like to give you the history lesson. Now, a lot of my colleagues don't believe in this, but I think this is important. You need to know that you know, people like the, these guys are really top of the game and they thought about this 24 seven for their entire life. And a lot of them are, are kind of considered old hat, right? Think about that. You spend your whole life. I mean, there are some physicists who did that. They're more economists in the graveyard of bad ideas. Okay, so you know, take a look at these guys. Um, these guys were out to show that you know, a simple-minded application of and I didn't even put, you know, I didn't even put, um, um, I didn't even put Phillips up there, even though it's his curve. He didn't get a Nobel Prize. And he actually, in his article, he said it's just a regularity. It's an empirical regularity. It's not the basis of policy. But in America and in the UK and in Germany, people started thinking this is a, a basis for policy. And the greatest example is the United States. Kennedy gets elected president, cuts taxes. Johnson gets into the Vietnam War. They start printing money in America to pay for it. They borrow from the rest of the world, okay? Putting a lot of stress on the international financial system. Inflation starts to rise. And then Nixon gets elected in 1968 and says, okay, time to raise taxes and slide right back down the Phillips curve, okay? But it's obvious that that, that's, that was just not gonna work. And Friedman and Phelps picked this up right away. They said, you're relating a rate of change in a nominal variable to the real stuff. You're violating all the ideas of neutrality of money that Hume talked about uh, back in lecture seven or eight, okay? And they were right. It took a while, but they got it right because the, the relationship did deteriorate. And this was a time when countries around the world were printing lots of money, creating lots of money, and the economy was moving fast, and people's expectations were being ratcheted up because they knew that governments were going to for the most part, try to avoid inf unemployment by creating more demand and financing, financing that with money creation. So the 1970s was a big challenge for economists, um, and Friedman and Phelps actually 
uh, got it right. Okay? So Milton Friedman, in his famous address to the American Economic Association in 1967, published in 1968, basically said, um, we need to think about micro-foundations. The rest of this course is about micro-foundations. So I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about people's decisions to consume and save, and then I'm going to talk about people's firm's decision to set prices. And that's going to drive what we think about inflation and the supply side. That's about as far as I can take you in this course. But later on, you can do more and more. You can th talk, th think about banks. You can think about um, you know, different types of households, inequality, and the rest. Therefore, expectations are key. So how do we model expectations in this world? Okay. Um, we had, we had the option of perfect, perfect information. Agents knew all the prices, so you can't, you, you know, but that's not the way it works. People sign contracts, they take a year, they take two years to play out. People can make mistakes, okay? So um, this is because it's costly to do that. It's costly to renegotiate every day your wage. It's costly to renegotiate prices every day with your suppliers, okay, with your customers. It's also aggravating, you know, we'll, we'll, one of the most famous uh, views of this is Julio Rodenberg, who said that firms can aggravate their customers if they raise their prices. And it's true. When you go to your favorite bar, and you go in there and you see the price of beer is five euros a glass, it used to be 350, or maybe it goes down to two, and you say, well, gee, I didn't, why didn't you tell me about this before? It's kind of, it, it, it raises the tension level, raises the blood pressure of some of the clients, customers. Okay, so this is an idea of why um, we have in, at least in, in reality, we have something like um, stickiness of prices. Okay, so we already had this in the, in the toy ASID model. We had uh, this, tr this core inflation or trend, you know, inflationary expectations, we called it. This, this um, we, we made it, you could also make, you could do it differently. You could make it a weight. This is a different formulation. So I'm going I'm to call this a, um, and you notice I use a different notation just to get you to think about it. I've got a weighted average of last period's value of the same core inflation plus the new information we learned by looking at the actual value. This is different from what I had before. Okay, this, is kind of, this, could, be, this could be like a type of Bayesian learning. You know, I, I, have, I have this Bayesian prior. I get a draw of inflation and then adjust my expectation given the, given the prior using Bayes' rule. It's a different, and a lot of people have tried to model inflation and expectations using that. Okay, so this is a different, so you could put that in your model. It gives you a different type of dynamic. It's also kind of interesting, okay? Again, but it kind of assumes that agents, the theta of the agents is fixed. It's written in stone, which is crazy, right? If you go to Venezuela, if you have that type of rule, you're, you're toast, right? Venezuela has 50% inflation per year, per month. This is ridiculous. You'll never make it. You know, any, so, so you have to have a reasonable view of how that can change over time. So here's what economists um, you know, thought about this. It got a lot of criticism because the, the original, I, I told you, in my um, core inflation um, equation before, theta equals zero, just assumes a backward-looking, uh, completely, um, you know, unintelligent way of thinking about inflation in the future. Um, the criticism was that this type of exportation, expectation uh, formation was assuming that people didn't understand the way the world works. And that just seems wrong, okay? Because unions, I don't know if you know this, but trade unions go to economists and get forecasts of inflation. They have economists. Some of you may go work for IG Metall. It'd be a great job. They have lots of money. And they, they pay their economists like they pay them the banking sector, maybe a little bit less. Um, and they use, they use their knowledge to give them, hey, this is what we think inflation is going to be. You better at least get that for your members. Otherwise, you're going to look, like, you're going to look stupid. Okay? So this is why Lucas and Sargent and others insisted on rational expectations. So we should at least impose the discipline of the model on um, the, the discipline that we assume agents to to be uh, using on the model itself, okay? It's not the same thing as perfect foresight because we do have shocks, and shocks mean there are unanticipated events um, for whatever reason. Okay, so here's the great hero of this way of thought. So Robert Lucas um, thought about rational expectations along with Tom Sarge, who also got a Nobel Prize later on, and 
with, in his case, he's also affiliated with the so-called Lucas critique, which you may have learned about in macro in your other classes, or maybe with me or Lutz Weinke in your macro at the Humboldt University. Lucas said that macroeconomic policy has to keep in mind that people's expectations also are conditioned on a regime of what they think the government's doing. So if the government's fighting inflation hard with a steep Taylor rule, it's going to lead to people having different anticipations than if they thought this is a pushover type of central bank. They're accommodating everything. Okay, so this is a you know, really deep, a deep point, uh, and the Nobel Prize is completely deserved. So rational expectations, this is something you should probably write down. There are three different ways of thinking about this. And they, they're kind of different levels of stringency uh, in our thought. And the most, the most frequently used one in model solving is the strong form. So we take the strongest possible version. We just assume that agents are as smart as we are. So the model has to at least replicate in their expectation what the model on average generates. Okay, so that's called the strong form rational expectations hypothesis. So many of you took my class in, in, uh, in the bachelor course. Um, this is kind of, I mean, I'm, I'm now giving you the, the, different, the different possibilities of rational expectations. It's much more complicated than, than I led you on to believe. The intermediate form would mean that agents have a subset of information that they can observe, which may not be the same as you have as an economist, and they use a conditional they form a conditional expectation based on that information, so it might be better than your information because maybe they have better information than you have, or maybe they don't. Maybe you actually do believe you know everything, but the agents don't know everything, and they still do as best they can. It basically means agents are doing the best they can given IT, the information set. Okay? The weaker form and a lot of people use this in finance, just means that people don't make systematic mistakes. So if you do finance, if you do finance, one of the most important things in finance is the efficient market hypothesis, which means that on average, the rate of return on stocks, okay, the, you know, the, 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 the persistent or pre predictable part of, on stocks is, is close to zero. People who trade in the markets, uh, you always hear about these guys who've done very well in, the mar in, in you know, trading, some strategy. But in general, you're only getting one side of the story. You're not getting all the failures, the people who lost tons of money. Most tra trading strategies, on average, don't yield better than the market rate of return. Okay, so unless the only reason they would yield more than the market rate of return is if you're bearing more risk. Okay, so it's kind of the, the CAPM version of this would say that um, if you do have positive um, excess returns in the market, that's because you're accepting to bear um, risk yourself, and that means you're, you're, it's a trade, okay? So the weak form would say basically that, for example, that first differences in the log of stock prices are unpredictable, okay? It's like the random walk hypothesis for asset prices, right? That's a, a very good example of the weak form of rational expectation. It just means that agents are processing information in a way that, in fact, ways that we, maybe they're using, you know, uh, fancy uh, machine learning techniques, okay, things that we don't do in this class, okay, and they're just basically not making any systematic mistakes. They may make mistakes, but on average they don't. Okay, so let's review a few facts about expectations before we get going because we have to start thinking about a model that has micro foundations and rational expectations and some clear view of what's driving it. Okay, so I'm really pushing you hard now. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna think about a random variable, so agents are gonna have to deal with some randomness in the economy, and they're gonna be taking decisions based on a future that is unknown, and they're gonna use information that's available to them in period T. So generally, we think about a probability law, little f, d defined on the set of states of the world, uh, big S. Okay, so you can think of the probability of observing little s, and then you can take expectations of that, and get an unconditional expectation, or you can get a you can say I know I know something about uh, the past, which helps me predict S. Not exactly, but in some loose sense. Um, and for that, we can make a following general statement. Okay, suppose you know I know some of the past, and um, let's say let's say that's. Uh, let's say that's J, and then I know I, I is basically J plus some new information. Okay, and then I'm gonna ask you, what is the expectation of a random variable X conditioned on the bigger information set? 
Okay, and what is the expectation of that expectation conditioned on the smaller information set? Well, the answer is it's going to be the expectation conditioned on the smaller information set. That's called the law of iterated expectations. That's going to help us think about the way agents form expectations moving through time. I'm not going to talk about this right away, but we're going to come back to this idea uh, later on in the course when we, when we think about um, agents thinking about the implication of the decisions for future actions. Because when you take a decision tomorrow, it's not just about tomorrow, it's about the day after tomorrow. Okay? Okay. That, Andreas will talk more about expectations in the next in the session after this one. Okay, so let me just summarize and then we'll talk about um, our first real serious macro model. So why is the ASAD model so lousy? Okay, I have lots of colleagues who really hate it. Some people don't even teach it. Okay, I have the feeling a lot of you may not go into economics. A lot of you may not even go into macroeconomics. So I think you should take something with you. And this is pretty good. You can do a lot with this. Okay, shifting the curves and at least structuring your thoughts. That's what it's all about, structuring your thoughts. Okay, but the problem is you want to go further in macro, this is not enough. Demand is not micro-founded in that model. We just assert there's some relationship with the interest rate. I don't, we don't know why. Okay, supply is not based on um, clear principles on how firms set prices uh, or how workers negotiate wages. Expectations formation is, is basically ad hoc. Uh, the, for, the perfect foresight case, the limit is kind of implausible. Even if you do something like that, um, if, you imp if you push people to be very, very rational, if you let the, um, the theta parameter go to one, you end up getting output being um, it's going to be some sort of uh, autoregressive process, but it's only based on supply shocks, okay? So this is not a really good theory of propagation, uh, what we call internal propagation. So the, 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 um, the, the holy grail of macro is trying to find the model that delivers a nice internal propagation of shocks, not something we just made up, okay? So what I had before was just made up. And a lot of people will criticize what I'm about to show you is just made up. Okay, so the idea behind macro is to keep pushing the, the envelope. How far can we uh, drive the model with things that look like uh, things that are driving agents' decisions? So a good example is the financial crisis. We know the banks had something to do with that. So before, 19, before 2008, models didn't have banks. Now models have banks. Okay, so if you do more advanced work in this, we'll have a, a banking sector. Um, uh, the same thing is true in the 1970s. Models didn't have a serious supply side. Okay, they didn't have a role for, for capital stock. It was kind of a Mickey Mouse setup. So you know, the response of, of, of macro to the, to the real world is basically a response to these types of challenges that come up. Okay, so we're going to look at more micro foundations. We're going to deal with rational expectations. We're going to put in a plausible internal propagation. One internal propagation mechanism is simply the fact that capital that is installed today affects the production possibilities tomorrow. Right? We learned that in Solo and, and Ramsey. If I give you more capital today, you have more capital tomorrow. Okay? But that's not enough. We probably need something like people's price setting behavior. How many, how many agents? are in the position to set prices tomorrow? What are the costs of setting prices, changing prices tomorrow? Okay, so in the next, the next half hour, I'm gonna stop talking about theory. Let's talk about some data. I want you to take some other stuff with you. If you leave macro forever, um, I want you to remember these things, okay? Macro is about growth. Luca said growth is the most exciting thing in macro because you, you just, you have to realize why, you know, if we can't explain why Honduras and South Korea started at the same place in 1960, and Korea is so far ahead of uh, Honduras today. If we can't explain that, we're in trouble. Okay, that's why I spent the first half of the course talking about growth, and then, then there's fluctuations. Okay, so even though we think growth is most important, we know that politicians and you care about the business cycle. So if you can't ignore the business cycle, if you have a, if you have a if you, can, if you have a lot of patience, you can ignore it. But most people don't have patience. And we, you know, we, we're still kind of worrying 
and wondering about this. Why, why do people care so much about the cycle? Is it the risk of unemployment? Is it the politicians worrying about losing their jobs because they get voted out of office? In a democracy, that's a possibility. Maybe there might be a revolution in a, in a dictatorship. Um, it's not really clear to me why these fluctuations are so important. If you think about the, the variance over, over time, remember this is the picture I showed you a long time ago. This is the evolution of GDP, um, normalized for size, you know, history, et cetera. It's a historical th series. Um, we've got some big fluctuations. They're not associated with the business cycle, they're associated with wars. Okay, and, and maybe a big, you know, the, a big, um, a few financial crises along the way. But in general, the last 40, 50 years of, of economic uh, development has been pretty, pretty stable. But still, we care about it. So I guess the idea, and this is log scale, so these, these little blips you know, have the same implication as these little blips here. I mean, it's, easy, it's easy to conclude that actually output was more volatile in the 19th century when we had the gold standard than it is today. Still, people care about the cycle. So I put a microscope on that data, and I look at Germany uh, between 1991 and 19. I see a lot of action. I see a lot of fluctuations. And we see a one big shock, which was the financial crisis. Okay? And you say, well, the financial crisis wasn't Germany's problem. It was the United States. But it obviously had an effect. Germany had a larger output loss than America did. And we have to understand that. It's because exports to the United States uh, declined dramatically. Also, the credit markets freezed up. Banks didn't want to lend internationally anymore. And a lot of American banks in Germany didn't want to lend anymore. And uh, this, the propagation of the cycle across national boundaries was, was quite extensive. So this is what we're going to learn about um, now. So again, the ways to do this, uh, you should know already. This is like if you just take, a, um, take an HP filter and apply it to the data, and then take the difference of that, this is what you get, okay? So you can see that these, 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 these are an absolute uh, constant price euros, so the, the cycles are getting bigger because the economy's bigger, right? So it's, it's, it's really, a, it's disingenuous to say that, ah, oh, Germany's recession was so bad because 200 billion euros uh, decline in, 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 in uh, GDP and value added at constant prices, that's not, really fair, you have to think about it in terms of percent, because macroeconomists know that what matters is the percentage change. Big economies have big fluctuations, small economies have small economy fluctuations. Okay, so we need, to, we need to get that out of our mind. So you might want to normalize by something. Might normal, you know, one way to normalize would be just to take the, take the deviations of the logarithmic trend. That's easy. You could also do what Burns and Mitchell did. So you remember what Burns and Mitchell did? If you didn't, you're going to learn. Burns and Mitchell, uh, economists from the 1920s and 30s in the United States that thought there's a science behind business cycles. I'm going to take the cycle that I showed you before, and I'm going to chop it into pieces, boom and bust. And I'm going to take each one of those pieces, and I'm going to treat it as an observation of a cycle. And then I'm going to take averages of those cycles. OK, so it's, I mean, it's, it's an interesting idea. In fact, they were even. They were even willing to compress time in the cycle. So they were willing to look at you know, cycles of 16 uh, quarter duration and cycles of 40 quarter duration as being equivalent and just normalizing on the length of the cycle to one. Okay, most people don't do that nowadays, but um, even if you don't, you get, you get a, an interesting set of pictures. I'm gonna show these to you. And this is taking, Eight OECD countries over 50 years quarterly data. Okay, so this is not this is not uh, this is model independent. This is stuff you can take with you uh, no matter what you do in life. Okay, you don't have to be a macroeconomist. You just have to be someone who cares about the world to 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 be interested in this. What do you see here? You see that private consumption expenditure. Okay, this is over the average cycle. This is 10 quarters before the peak of the cycle, and this is. 10 quarters after the peak of the cycle. Okay, and I haven't, I haven't detrended these data, so you see the trend. After every cycle, things get better, okay, into the next uh, downturn. And there's a sharp decrease at the point when the recession starts, and you have a slow recovery. This is the average behavior over eight countries. 
Some countries have a few deviations from that. But the important thing is this is a, an average behavior, and that's kind of what we're interested in these models, because like Lucas said, business cycles are kind of all alike. They have a lot of similar dominant characteristics. This is consumption. Remember, Y equals C plus I plus G plus NX, okay? This is I, okay? This is C, and this is I. Lots of volatility investment. This is investment spending. Only 20 to 30% of GDP, huge volatility. So write that down. Investment expenditures, highly volatile. If anything brings down Germany in the next few quarters, it's gonna be investment spending. Okay, it might be investment spending um, in the value added chain for the UK because we're getting Brexit. It might be the chain with the United States because we're investing to build cars for Americans that don't want to buy them anymore, okay? Uh, it could be um, uncertainty about bin, building uh, Windräder um, or power lines, okay? So it's a lot of, a lot of in, this is really a different type of behavior. It's also pro-cyclical. <coughs> this is government spending. This is government purchases of goods and services. On average, no correlation with the cycle. Surprising. We, we often think governments actually try to act against the cycle. Well, maybe they did. This is an average. Maybe sometimes they did and sometimes they didn't. This is an average. So there's no systematic tendency of government spending to get ahead of the cycle or, or fall behind it. This surprised me. This is probably a publishable result. Um, this is real money. So if anybody wanted to say something about that, what would you say? If you were a banker and you were thinking about giving loans, this is, I mean, again, six quarters before the peak of the cycle, what do you see happening? Yeah, it's not just slowing down, it's flattening out. And remember, the balance sheet of the consolidated bank to, banking sector has liabilities, money balances on, on the liability side, and on the asset side, it has loans, and investments. So what's happening here is that banks stop lending. They're slowing down their credit, um, giving credit, um, extending credit up to six. This is, this is an average, so you can imagine how, how different many of these countries are. This, so this is, you know, again, the, the idea behind Burns' Mitchell is you're taking this average tendency. So real money balances, real money, which is M1 or M2 divided by, here we used M1, divided by P, the price level, okay, is a leading indicator. So this is something you might want to be able to capture in one of your models. Okay, here's some other interesting indicators. Look at, look at nominal interest rates. Pro-cyclical but slightly um, lagging. Stock price is clearly leading. Stock price indicator is basically the, is, an, is the, um, the nominal stock price index divided by the, the CPI. Okay, that's why it doesn't have a trend. Okay, so interesting. Interest rates, long-term look like the short-term rates and the differential, the spread. In, in, interest rates tend to invert when the recession is on the way, okay? In fact, the zero point is when the, the long-run interest rate is below the short-run interest rate. So these are important, robust, stylized facts that we want to care about. Here's some other ones that might interest you. Productivity is pro-cyclical, on average, but it drops sharply in the onset of a recession. The first two quarters after a recession, it drops. Okay? So that's going to be a challenge for us to explain. Employment, we hope that employment drops. Employment is obviously pro-cyclical, but it's also a lagging indicator. Unemployment is also a lagging indicator. Real wages don't do much. Real wages kind of just keep on going, but they're, they're kind of smooth. And the wage share, wage share is the, you can think of, this is a very important variable. This is kind of a proxy for the, the ratio of wages to nominal productivity of workers. Just take W times L divided by P times Y and write it as W divided by YP, or PY, divided by L. 
This is kind of a, this is a, a way of thinking about wages in relation to pro productivity. So you see that actually in a recession, the wage share rises, it goes up, okay? The profit share is the, is the converse or the, the, uh, the complement of the wage share would be one minus this. So profits tend to rise uh, in, in the boom time, but then they fall when the recession starts. So, so capital takes a hit in recessions. It's one way of thinking about this. Okay, so we could summarize this by saying, and again, this is um, summarizing other things that we um, didn't discuss directly. Recurring cycles are irregular, so the Slutsky approach is a good idea. You know, uh, magnitude is small relative to average GDP. That's the Lucas idea. But most of the action is the growth trend, but we still get this, these, um, these cycles. They, they seem to look similar. But if you think about it, if we could just organize our society, we could probably avoid the welfare costs of, of these fluctuations, but we don't. People get mad. They vote people out of office, et cetera. Consumption and investment are pro-cyclical. The current account is therefore counter-cyclical and government sp spending doesn't look like much of anything, okay? Investment is more volatile. Private consumption and government consumption are less volatile. Okay, so this investment is a driver of the cycle. We think, and, and investment is driven by, you know, animal spirits, business people taking decisions, looking to the future. It's a very important part of the, of the theory. And a lot of other variables move with the cycle as well. Some move pro-cyclically, some counter-cyclically. Some are leading indicators, like financial variables, and some are lagging, like the labor market variables. Okay, so these are the things that are gonna guide the next um, two blocks of the course, the two models that we're gonna look at. Okay, so now I have a nice picture for you to break up the monotony a little bit. I see some of you are falling asleep. <laughs> so who are these dudes? If you don't remember the guy on the right, I, I feel sorry for you, okay? <laughs> He's not very important anymore, but uh, in fact, I kind of miss, I kind of miss him. Yeah. <laughs> Who are the other two guys? Anybody? So I only show Nobel Prize uh, winners in this course, right? This was a reception for two Nobel Prize winners. Huh? No, that's not, oh, come on. <laughs> I think Friedman was on it. He was still alive, but he was pretty old. Okay, these two are the fathers of the, of the model I'm gonna to present to you now. This is Finn Kidland and Edward Prescott. Okay, Finn Kidland is Norwegian and spends a lot of his time at the, at the business school, um, what's it called, Bergen, and um, Prescott is at Arizona, okay? They used to both be Minnesota uh, guys. I think Kidland was also at Carnegie Mellon, okay? So they got the Nobel Prize in 2004 for their work on the real business cycle model, the RBC stochastic growth model. So again, this is the bridge to the first part of the course. Take the first part of the Ramsey course, the part, and think of taking the Ramsey model, chopping it up into discrete periods, and shocking every period with a shock. And only one shock. Shock to the production function. Now, why do they do that? So they basically, in their famous paper in Econometrica in 1982, they said, is it possible to generate the cycles that I showed you before without any recourse to money, without any reference to a financial sector? And they were probably fascinated by the fact that in the gold standard, you know, the financial sector was kind of, you had this gold standard, so the Fed didn't have, there was no Fed. There was no central bank in the United States until 1913. Okay, so the gold standard, you still had cycles, right? So this is kind of an interesting fact. Some of the most impressive development of the world economy in the Western economy was in the years 1850 to, 18, to 1910, okay? So these guys were kind of driven by this fascination with the possibility, not necessarily the assertion that it was so, but is it possible to generate cycles in a model without any banks or money at all? So imagine a world where money's neutral, people get it right, like we have the theta going to, uh, to, to one uh, in our baby toy model. How would that look? So the, the source, the, the shock that will be propagated in this model is 
technology. So a lot of techno people like this, you know, technology. Um, we, we tend to think there are other things that drive models. You know, maybe consumer optimism, maybe investment, animal spirits, um, maybe trade shocks, maybe, but also maybe banking and financial shocks. So we can expand the model. But right now we're going to take a model with just one shock and see how far we can push it. That was the idea behind Kidlin and Prescott. And can we generate cycles that look like the ones I just showed you? Because that was the genius of the, that's why I think this is a great, and it also, the fact that people still use the basic setup, even in the new Keynesian um, paradigm, is tribute to these two guys. Okay? So that's why I showed you the picture before, right? So you have some respect for these guys. Okay. So let me just give you some, some words, and then I'll write down some equations. I already gave you the historical stuff. So the real business cycle is kind of like the ramsey cass koopmans model because it has agents with an, with an infinite horizon. So we have really smart agents in this model. They have rational expectations. They don't know the future perfectly, but they have a pretty good understanding of how it works. The model is discrete time. Every, you know, t equals 1, 2, 3. There's no 2.5 or 7.9 or something. It's, it's basically t is from the set of integers. Um, we have supply shocks. Where are the supply shocks? Yeah. And these supply shocks are shifts to the production function. Okay? Now, one of the weaknesses of this setup is that these, these shocks are persistent in their setup. So they had to cheat a little bit to make this work. I'm, I'm saying this because it's being filmed and maybe someday Prescott will click on my website and take a look at this because he knows this. But it's a fact that to get this model to work really well, you have to assume that the technology shock has a bit of persistence in it. And that is what we call a deus ex machina. You're assuming kind of what you want to prove. But the idea was still so good that we let this one go. OK? So again, keep that in mind. It's just a little reference. Now, this is where it gets a little bit complicated. The model has a once you have it give that one shock, it has a trajectory back to the steady state, but it's a unique, it's a unique trajectory. There's only one. So in the sense of Ramsey, it's a little bit like jumping on that saddle path and coming back to the steady state. So if you remember, we had these complicated paths with the arrows and stuff, and Andreas told me I shouldn't show that to you because it's, it's boring. It's exciting because that's where, <laughs> that's where this is coming from. Okay? You have a, a unique trajectory given one shock, the trajectory to the steady state, is unique. So this is what we call saddle stability. And this will have an implication for the roots of the system that we will write down. So keep that in mind. That's why it's important to understand characteristic, um, the eigenvalues of the matrix and the, the roots, et cetera. OK. And I already gave you the historical, so I want to so repeat this. Um, it's really it's a, it's a lovely story. OK? So I should tell you one thing. Ramsey. Ramsey had the central planner, and she was in charge of everything, remember? The central planner. She was really smart. She did it. She solved this using Pontryagin's maximum principle. Well, in this setup, we're going to have decentralized markets. So we're going to decentralize the system. And it turns out that because of the way we've cooked the model, it works. And it turns out also that the, the social planner's optimum, if we wanted to solve it, would give us the same answer as the decentralized outcome. Okay? Again, that's because the, the first welfare theorem applies in this model. I've, the model will be cooked in such a way that preferences are normal preferences um, with geometric discounting, um, non-time inconsistent preferences, technology gives rise to constant returns to scale, Markets are competitive. Firms are price takers. Workers are wage takers. Okay? There are no externalities, and everyone's got the same information set. So there's no possibility that we would deviate from the first welfare theorem of, of economics. So let's just start with that to get going. And again, I promise you, if you go on to do this for a living, 
you will deal only with economies where the first welfare theorem fails and the government has a role to play, almost by construction. As soon as you have monopolistic competition, firms are setting prices. You don't have a competitive market anymore. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Now, a good model, you need to write down what you have. Do you have, you have households, households have budget constraints, firms employ the labor of the households, and the firms have technology, and the firms use labor, and they use capital. Where do they get the labor? They hire it from the households. Where do they get the capital? They also hire it from the households. So this is a representative agent model. Okay, now one of the biggest criticisms of macroeconomics in the past 20 years is that we spend too much time staring at these kind of models, because we think that you can summarize all the interesting incentives by looking at a single agent. And if you think about it, what what kind of interesting stuff could we have if we had a rich agent and a poor agent? And the rich agent had all the capital and the poor agent had to work, okay? That's the next step. Those are called heterogeneous agent models, okay? But right now you have to understand this. And this is already involving a fair amount of, of uh, elaborate mental gymnastics. Okay, so I'm gonna write down those incentives the preferences, I'm gonna write down market structure, I'm gonna derive optimal behavior, and then I'm gonna derive an equilibrium concept. That's how we're gonna proceed. So for the rest of this, this presentation, and also next week, we're gonna think about additive periodic utility. So in each period, the agent has, consumption, has utility over consumption and leisure, and leisure is L, sorry, leisure is one minus L. So think of L as the fraction of the day that, think of L as the fraction of the day that you work, so one minus L is the amount of leisure that you can enjoy. So the second argument is bounded from above by one, by construction, okay? So we're gonna have labor supply in this model. We're gonna to try to explain employment, okay? And we're gonna use the following uh, function. It's a logarithmic function of consumption in real terms, and it's gonna be a, a power function um, with uh, eta as a an interesting parameter which is gonna summarize the elasticity of labor supply. Then we're gonna have Cobb-Douglas production. So Cobb-Douglas production has lovely properties. It may not be the perfect production function. It's a good starting place for us. It was the starting place for Kidlin and Prescott. Okay, so we'll start there. It has, it has a beautiful form, look at it. And we're gonna have this thing called Z which is the state of technology. So if you shock Z, holding K and L constant, you get more output and that that sets the model in motion, because in that, in that moment, agents have incentives to invest more because product, productivity is higher. Workers may have incentives to work more because maybe the wages are higher. So that's what, kind of what's gonna give rise to the cycle. In this model. Similarly, if Z goes down, people kind of not interested in saving and investing anymore. They're not interested in working and they take a break. Okay, so that's kind of the, that's the, a very, very loose uh, summary. So here are the ingredients. Okay, we're gonna start with, it. this is what expected utility looks like. Once you've accepted what I said before, it's gonna, since we're dealing with discrete time, we don't use an integral anymore, we use the summation of utility in each period. Beta is the discount factor that you're already familiar with from the OLG model. Beta is less than one. So that thing is defined. Okay, so you get positive utility in every period from consumption and you get, you get um, negative utility from working hard. The more you work, the less leisure you have. So this, ex this already imposes some interesting structure on the model. It, imp it imposes intratemporal separability, not just intertemporal separability. It imposes intratemporal se separability. The marginal utility of consumption is independent of how much you're working. And a lot of people think that's kind of a, a, kind of a lousy assumption. But we don't have very good information or ideas on how there are newer ways of thinking about this, but this is, this is the benchmark we're gonna start with. The second equation is the capital accumulation equation, the so-called Goldsmith equation. And note that uh, depreciation is partial. If, if delta were equal to one, then basically you'd have to start from scratch like Robinson Crusoe every year. You'd have to you know, decide how much of my wheat do I plant and how much do I eat. Okay, well in this case you can store it. Okay, so the capital stock is moving uh, through time and that's KT, all right? And then we have the Cobb-Douglas production function and now look what I've done. I've, I've given ZT a life of its own. ZT is now what we call a stochastic process. 
okay? Um, means that ZT is random. So I know what ZT is today, but I don't know what it's gonna to be tomorrow. I can, I can possibly use the past to predict ZT. Um, and the way Kitlin and Prescott started this is they set it up like this, okay? So basically, ZT is equal to the, a power of ZT minus one. And if you take logs of that, it's gonna be one minus rho times um, that power. Uh, it's gonna be rho times that log of that power, uh, sorry, the log of that value of ZT minus one, plus one minus rho times the steady state of Z, call it Z bar, plus stuff that may depend on time. So if we take the time trend out, it disappears, and you've got the shock. And epsilon is white noise. So that's the stuff that really is purely unpredictable as we go through time. Nobody knows that what well, that's going to be next period. Okay, and that's, again, that's a fundamental implication of these models that, that again, regardless of what process you're talking about, um, a shocked difference equation is important. So this is, our, this is a great example of the shock difference equation in the log of technology. This type of technology has a special name. We already discussed it in the first part of the course. We called it, do you remember? Type of technical progress, or three types? Harrod neutral technical progress. Okay, it's important. Write it down. Okay, it, it's labor augmenting. It, it makes people look like they're getting, you know, bigger, more powerful, and by the virtue of that, even though they capture all the, the effects of their increased size, um, um, that's why it's called labor augmenting technical progress, as opposed to capital augmenting so-called solo technical progress or Hicks neutral technical progress. In the Cobb-Douglas function case, they're all isomorphic, okay? Remember that. I mean, some of you nod and say, I, I get that. Many of you don't know what I'm talking about. Just remember that, it's important. In the Cobb-Douglas, it doesn't matter, but if you try any other production function, it's gonna matter. It's gonna matter. So we need, to keep, we need to keep pushing this. I've only got two minutes. I'm just gonna set, set it up. Next week, I'll actually write down the optimization problem. Uh, we're thinking about, a, again, we're thinking about competitive markets. And because we don't have any money in this economy, we only have one good, the prices are easy. The only price is the intertemporal price. So I'm producing schmooze today. The wage is in terms of schmooze. So W is a real wage. R is the a number of schmoos I get in period T plus one if I put a unit of schmoo to work in the capital stock tomorrow. Just like Ramsey, okay? You know what a schmoo is? It's the, the single good in this economy. In every period there's just one good. And we eat it, we smoke it, we drink it, we put it in our cars to make it run. It's just the aggregate Hicks bundle of the, of the economy that's produced by the production function. Okay, it's a single good economy. So this is a really simple, this is, but it really, it's, it's simple, but it's complicated. The, the, the amazing thing is out of this simplicity, you can get complexity. So if you go further, then once you've mastered this, you're in, in great shape. Okay, so if you go and do a PhD in some foreign country, this will be great starting. You will already have a leg up on many of your competitors, but believe me, this is just the start. The last part is very important. Firms are owned by the households. Okay, so this is like Bill Gates is my brother. <laughs> so on average, the US economy benefits from all the wealthy guys. And believe me, if you do the math, even if Bill Gates were my brother, if you were all my brothers too, it wouldn't make much of a difference. Okay, I mean, it'd make a little difference, but uh, I mean, I'd like to have a piece of the US uh, profit share, but it's just, I mean, let's, if we're reasonable, we're talking about an average family, so you've got people, families that are better off, families that are worse off, we're describing the average family in this economy. The assumption is that the firms own the capital. So KT is the vehicle for savings, just like in the OLG model, except you're saving forever now. You're saving for your children. It's a single, it's a representative family. K is the way you save. L is the way you work. So we have labor in this economy, unlike Ramsey. This is a, an, an accretion, if you like. It's an expansion of the model. 
and we don't have money. Okay, so the, to summarize, preferences, technology, market structure, optimal behavior, and then finally, what is the equilibrium? What is gonna describe the situation where workers supply the labor they want to at the, the wage they face? Uh, firms demand the capital to use in production at the expected rate of interest or rate, rate of interest they face. Okay, so with this, I'll let you go. So it's really important that you spend a little time on this, um, you know, and spend some time with Andreas uh, this week. Okay, thank you for your attention.